relaxed and recharged and we're ready to go again. So it's good to see everybody here this morning. So we're uh, uh, start out here. We're going to need a approval of the agenda. So do I have a motion? motion? Approve. Okay, got a motion. I'll second. Got a second from uh, Ms. Knight. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, the uh, next on the list is consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda today is the approval of the regular session minutes for December 13th, 2021, and approval of our COVID masking policy. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda as presented. Okay. Have a motion for Mr. Rogers. I have a second. I'll second. Second for Mr. Bryant. <clears throat> Any discussion? All in, all in favor? Aye. Aye. The uh, discussion agenda, uh, first on our list this morning is discussion of our population study. And uh, we'd like to welcome this morning uh, Mr. Powell uh, to, uh, to our uh, meeting this morning. And he's going to take us through the uh, population study that he's done for us. So uh, we'll turn it over to, to Mr. Powell. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can see where this mouse is over here. And we'll and one, two, three, full screen. Hard for me to see from this distance. But first, I'd like to thank you for entrusting me to provide data and guidance with the uh, with the enrollment study and forecast, and for the students at Stokes County. And I don't take this trust that you've given me with lightly. I know it's important, and the students always come first. It's right there on the logo, and so we need to consider as we go forward that these studies are pertaining to students and the directions we're going. Now, as we look forward, first I'd like to say, I looked at a lot, tons and tons of data and years of data and other enrollment studies and gathered vital statistics, birth rates, facilities, Stokes staff, staff gathered enrollment data, kindergarten, early college, facilities, Facility surveys previously done in 91, 92, and 78. In the Stokes County government, who gathered information and in population densities. Now, all of those, once we get to thinking about them and put them together, <clears throat> I always like to look at multiple sources and multiple data and to pull them together and then kind of like assembling a puzzle and you start getting one piece and then you bring another piece and you bring another piece. And I don't want just one set of data. I want two or three sets of data. So all of these multiple data get you two or three different kinds, different sources, different solutions. You get different information and trends and trying to find a an alignment of trends and information. And if you get a lot of sources gathering and making sense and tying together, then you get a more solid end result. So out of that, we've got a lot of solid end results in this. <coughs> so we get to get a forecast, we're gonna start with the kindergarten. And if you took the kindergarten class you have today, and that's one piece of data, but if you go back 20 years, and you look at the trends, then you can start to say, well, how did they roll through classes? Then we get at today's kindergarten and say, well, they're going to be 10 to 13 years from now, they're going to be in high school and they're going to graduate. Now, those kids are in school. So as we look at them, we're going to rely a lot on that. So we got four factors. We got county population, births, kindergarten, student enrollment, and time all together. Now there's an important piece of that. In 2010 and 2020, the census tracked information. And you think, well, the census is out for 2020. Yes, it is. It does not have published yet 
and we've researched it to the state and the federals, and they have not sent out the population per census tract of those five years old and under that would tell us where in the county they're located. That's huge. It also doesn't tell us from five to 17 year olds, which is your current enrollment. Where is that enrollment located? So we're a little bit in um, shortage of information for the future, in particular, elementary. The middle and high in 10 years, they're in school. They're in kindergarten. And in, in a minute, you'll see how they track their kindergarten. So we're going to use all those. So let's start with the county and the data, and the purple lines being the trend. And so you can see since 19... Uh, 75 ish, and before that, Stokes County general population has grown the blue line. And since 2010 to 2020, the overall Stokes population has dropped a couple of thousand in Stokes County as a whole. In this section, this came from the Stokes 2035 guide. And I use that several times, but at the bottom of that, it's, it's almost impossible to read. The number of children are working age adults. 18 to 64, they are declining. And the, continue to decline, and they are declining faster than the population. Your population is aging. You can see the aging, 28% will be 65, and then it goes up from there. So now you, Stokes County has become an older population, and the youth of the county is not growing as much as the older group. So then we look at Stokes County live births, back from 73, and you roll down a few births, this is per year, and you come out here to 1997 for the peak births, and then the births have continued in a downward trend in the last few years, a little different. But if you follow that trend line and look at that 30-year trend line and say, how can I look to say, how many babies will there be in the county in the future? And we can't continue this 30-year trend because, as you can see, if you continue it out here off the screen on the right, you're going to come to there aren't going to be any babies in Stokes County. Well, we're not going to get there. But the last 10 years, you can see it went down pretty good, and then it trended and it turned a little bit negative. It's not positive, it's a little negative. So if we follow the 10-year trend, it's, it's different. And traditionally, at the end of each 10-year period or thereabouts, you should reevaluate, has anything changed in the last 10 years? If you'd have thought back here in 10 years before at... 2010, if you continued the trend, it would have it would have rocketed down here. So we've got to evaluate our years to see what's different. But that trend line, the purple one, let's get the slope of the purple one. And then we have a slope of a 30-year trend on births. Same slope, peak, back here in 96, 97. And that continues forward. Now you notice out here in the last 10 years, the births have somewhat leveled off if you follow this line out. So now we're going to think about if we followed the 30-year trend, and you think about the hurricane cones, and what is the forecast area, and what is the variable that's possible. So if you look at the trend, you say, well, it could be a few more, there could be a few less. So you got the 30-year trend. Or if you look at the 10-year trend, it's different. You're still decreasing with 383 babies born in 2000, in 2020. And that says, as you roll out, 361 is forecast in 2030. That's births. And if I go back, that's 303 forecast. And the trend that I'm using is a 10-year trend. So that is more sustainable, meaning you're going to have babies continue to be born in Stokes County for years and years and years as far as we can go. So with that in mind, let's look at the enrollment forecast. 
So the enrollment forecast, the same purple line with trends, you went from the peak enrollment in 99-2000, that's here. And then it had some sharp drops right in here. This is a pretty heavy drop in the first 10 years once the peak classes started moving out. And if you follow that trend out and you say, okay, this is a forecast, everything in the gray is a forecast section. So this is forecast and it follows along the same 10-year trend if we follow these 10-year trends. Then we look at the actual district enrollment and it smooths out. It's not quite because it has 13 years of students and data. Back here in 74, 75, and we had a little bump in 80 in here, and then it went down a little, and then it climbed back up again. And now it has been falling consistency for 10, 20 years. And the forecast is that it will continue to drop. And that enrollment then takes you right on down. So what could change these trends? So you see trends, and they're all, and the schools are in a downward trend. The only upward trend was Stokes County general population as they age. What could change it? More or fewer births. Economic development, job opportunities. Increased farming, land-based. Increased tourism, hospitality. Families become larger. The trend now is families are smaller. They don't have 10, 10 kids. Most don't have five anymore. Inflow of childbearing age adults, meaning it's a suburban environment, and childbearing adults are moving in. And then you have opportunities identified in the Stokes County 2035 planning document. Now, this document that I'm going to hold up right here, this is a document produced around 2014-15. And this goes into a lot of possibilities in Stokes County of growth and where the strengths are in Stokes County and how they work. But this ties, and this is where the aging population came from. Mr. Powell, just real quickly, that is a county document that was referenced here that he's referencing again. That is one that was not made by us or anything. That was made by the county that, that he received from the, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. Okay. Stokes County Planning. And if you look into the small sections of there for the executive summary, introduction, economic development, recreation, transportation, and infrastructure, all of those are referred to in the booklet. So, if <coughs> until trends are affected, meaning what event or events would cause the trend to be affected, and it says, use the trends to forecast the student enrollment. So in a minute, you're going to see, we're going to talk about the peak birth rate in 94, enrolled in kindergarten five years later. And as you go through 13 years, in 12, 13, they're now graduating. So if you follow this trend, those students, and I'm bringing this together, saying the birth rate to the kindergarten and follow it through 12 years. And I, right now, there's not a trend saying that's going to change, so the district control enrollment will continue to decline unless you get more babies or more move-in. So the next slide has lots of numbers, and I don't expect you to look at the numbers and read it. In your board packages, you should have a board pack. And this has 12 years of, this has 24 years of information, all of this information was given by Stokes County Schools to me in all areas in the gray, as well as to the births. This is a column of births gathered from state data, and this is the year they're born, and each year transforms five years later into I was enrolled. And the peak kindergarten enrollment happened at the top of this. I did not show this as a downward line to reflect trends. I show this as following a cohort, kindergarten through graduation. And in between each year, by using calculations of how many kindergartens moved to first grade, and there's a percentage. 
Maybe in here I refer to 101%, 100, 102, 98, 94, 93. So all of these are percentages that move from this year kindergarten to the next year they're in first grade. That's important because I didn't put that formula in between every one of these all the way out, but it's there. And that forecast, the traditional movement of students from first to second to third. And if you come down to read the chart, this is also the largest eighth grade class. Above it, they're smaller. They're gradually growing to hit the peak. And since that peak class, now they're decreasing on down. So in there, the eighth graders go from 613 to 449. That's eighth grade. So in that 10 year, 12 year period, they decreased. Now this, I put that gap in there for a reason. This is eighth grade to ninth grade. And traditionally, the whole state, this, you're not unique, the whole state, eighth grade to ninth grade, you have more ninth graders enrolled. That has generally been attributed to private schools, public schools, religious schools. Once those students get of high school age, they want the whole high school social environment be it sports, be it PE, be it band, be it theater. They want the socialization. And think about how that a bunch of teenagers, you get them together and they're inseparable. Well, that's what high school environment produces. So if you think about this number, back in 2000, 16% increase from eighth grade to ninth grade. And you think, wow. That also is a tributor to saying you had move-in population. That maybe they had some younger kids, but when they went to high school, they came into your high schools. What's different is 16%, and the next 10 years later, it's 10%. The next 10 years later, which is current, is 5.3% increase from eighth grade to ninth grade students. So as you can see, the county, it appears to, in my experiences, indicate that you have less move in with students. And so now you've got a lot of students that are here and this is more percentage wise what most districts have. It's a traditional increase. Now, if they're growing, you know, the wakes and the max, they're gonna have a bigger number for move in population once they go from eighth to ninth. And then you follow this on out to graduation. This is your peak class. And I look to say, is there any differences? You know, another 12 years later. And you're following generally the same thing, but above that, 458 in eighth grade. You have 452 going up, 435, 475. So as you go up the page, there are fewer. So which means your enrollment's declining. And from here down, you're going 425, 419, 425, 407, 3, 342. So your decrease each year is moving downward. So now let's say, where are we going? So let's take, this is the last year of actual, this is 21, 22. 403 <coughs> kindergartens enrolled. Now, if we took those 403 kindergartens and used the same formulas all the way through, those kindergartners next year would be in first grade with 415 because the random says you grew by 103% sometimes. Sometimes you decreased by 90, by 5%. So it's always <clears throat> that plus three to 5% in Stokes County from 100%. So if you follow these kindergarten, the current enrolled kindergarten to eighth grade, you've got about the same amount at 388 students. And then you have the traditional increase, 5.3%, by the, using the same last 10 years of data, enrolling the 5.3%, you got an increase, 385 to 429, 
and then you follow those out as they go out. And you got to think about the uh, graduation rate and the dropouts and so forth in order to get this, because these numbers are a negative number in all cases as you lose some students going through high school. These students are in school. And the survivorship of every class following the history when you go out and it is 4,762 students right here. And that is in 32, 33 when they graduate. You are currently at 5,422. So just following the students that you have through elementary, middle, and high, you're going to decrease from 5,422 to 4,762. <coughs> They're in there. It's coming. It's real. So that 10 to 12 year forecast is not a subjective opinion. That's following the survivorship traditionally through your school system, which is good survivorship, by the way. Once we get into the pink color, this has some forecasting in it. So these births are real. They haven't entered school yet, but when they enter school, those using the same formulas, you're going to roll them over. And so this area is not really as much of a forecast. Those children are in Stokes County. And as a whole, within 3 to 5%, they're going to bounce right at 100% of those babies born will be here. I think that's a tribute to Stokes County Schools in that Stokes County is maintaining to keep the students born in this county, they remain in this county, and they're going to school in this county. That's huge. You can talk about charters and others, and maybe there's 140 students in a charter school, maybe there's 50 students in a religious school. And those numbers are pretty close to what are forecast at the state of 140, 50 to 140 religious and charters. So it's not big in relationship to these total enrollment numbers. And it depends by year, whether it's 95% entering school or 103%. That's pretty close. That's just a few students. But this brings you to the forecast. This area in pink is actually forecasting children that have not been conceived yet. Because they're moving down and say, how many children will be conceived and born in 2031-32? And this line follows that 10-year trend you just saw of births. It does not follow the 30-year trend, which would be much more drastic. And this brings you to the total 300 and 61 down at the bottom that you saw in that trend, 361, there's that number, which is roughly two to three students fewer per year of births. But it's all in a downward direction. So that kind of sets the stage for the next step. The last 20 years, the total enrollment dropped 1,872 students, or 936 in 10 years. Your birth rate declined from 526 to 380. Your enrollment declined. That number matches 1872. <coughs> the next 10 years, forecasting to drop 620 students in 10 years, not 936. 620 student drop. And then use the birth trend to say, is it going to change? And the enrollment in that same 10 years, today's enrollment to the enrollment in 2031. So knowing that, we forecast how many students would be in Stokes County. So the next question is, where will they be? And if you trend this, now I'm going to spend a second, I'm going to hit this chart. This was produced by Stokes County GIS Planning. It's very good. It's Stokes County homes added between 2015 and 21. Stokes County <coughs> took this parameter. They did this chart. They know where the permits are. 
they know where the homes are. Darker colors mean more homes were added. Lighter colors mean less homes were added. So if you look, all the darker colors are down in your south and southwest, and your lightest colors are up in your north and northeast. Keep that perspective in mind as we look at the next one, but I'm going to spend a second talking homes. So does the addition of homes or apartments directly relate to more enrollment? A lot of different answers. Lots of questions. Are they moving from one Stokes County home to another? They may build a new home in the south and west. I say that because that's the largest new home. And if they move from the north and east, because it's the fewest, you didn't change your enrollment. You just moved them from one corner of the county to another corner of the county. So you didn't grow as a district. Next, are the home buyers new to Stokes County? Next, are the buyers of childbearing age? Do they already have children? If so, what are their ages? And general trends, in my experiences, and I've done a lot of these trends, is larger home sale prices have fewer youth. You can kind of put that in, the, in you know, my life lesson and maybe yours as you start a home and you're newly married and you're of childbearing age, you may not have the uh, funds necessary because you're still growing in your salary and in your income. And as you get more income and you get older and you move up the ranks and in the income level, then you have a little more money so you can buy a more expensive home. So traditionally, the larger home prices have fewer youth and are more likely to have older children, if so. Typically, they're not starter homes. And some developments take years to build out, and some never do. <clears throat> So, the new home buyers increase in Rome. My experience is no. If you're in a huge growing area, then yes. If you go to Wake County, Mecklenburg, Union County, uh, Durham, they're moving into the inner city. So, you've got all of those spaces where they're growing. Guilford, a lot of houses. For site, yeah, it's having houses, but the youth population is kind of neutral. The student population in Forsyth has become more neutral. <coughs> so I'm going to move to the next and talk about, now this may give you a little bit of insight to say, where will the students of the future be located? So if we look at the students that are in school, youth 5 to 17, the darker color is more students. The lighter color is less students. This is a census information. And this was produced by Stokes County Planning Office. So if you look, the largest student population center is in the south side of the county. And in particular, here's your darkest colors in the south and west. And say, now let's rub the crystal ball a little bit and let's move to future school age that are now under five years old. So these children are born, they're under five. So where are the darker colors again? So if you look, here's the darkest again. What this, if you get to looking at the colors, now look over here, this one has some more color and there are fewer five-year-olds, so this area in the under five-year-old means most likely you'll have fewer students than you do currently. And if you look at this area, your northeast, Sandy Ridge, if you look at the Sandy Ridge, these, by the way, are on school attendance areas. So Sandy Ridge, Lawsonville, Nancy Reynolds and so forth across here, Pinnacle. Uh, there's three down in the King area, Rule Hall, Pine. So you get down in these areas. So what does this tell you? This area that has a little 
a little darker than the lightest. Now it gets darker, so you have more under five-year-olds, which means this area has the potential to have more students. This doesn't say a lot more. It says some more. Please note that. It says some more, not a lot more. A lot more would move this color into the darker colors. You're not there yet. So this is, you'll have some more <coughs> students in the north and east. This area remains the most likely to have under five. And this has your school age. So this may give you a little insight if you're rubbing the crystal ball of where the kid's going to be and not be. You can see this area became lighter. These areas, and you, there's little subtle looks here, this area became lighter in this area. See, both of these, this is lighter than this, so slight decrease. Notice in here, you have fewer under five-year-olds in here than you do currently in school. Uh, let's see, that is, give me that section. Poplar again. Springs. Poplar Springs. Yes. So Poplar Springs has fewer under five-year-olds than the Poplar Springs that are currently in school. <clears throat> now I'm going to relate that and give you the big picture of the county. So when you look at this and say, where are the students at today? Now this orange line follows the elementary, so the southwest corner of your county has 50% of your students, southeast corner 32%, northern side of the county 18% of your students. So three-fourths of the county and one-fourth of the county. So if you're looking to where should you have the most amount of schools or the fewest amount of schools, or where are the most amount of students and the fewest amount of students, this map should tell you a little bit. This area has the possibility of growing, but this area has the possibility of shrinking, so I don't see this changing in overall total student. It means maybe they're shifting from here to Sandy Ridge. I don't know that. Maybe they're shifting from Nancy Reynolds to down in this section. I don't know that. Can't get that info without the 2020 census that has not been done. Office of State Budget Management, North Carolina does not have that information. Is there a projected time when they think they may release it? They have talked about within the year. But bear in mind, 2010 has not given that information yet either, and that's 12 years away. Okay. So a great question, by the way. but it probably won't change a lot from where you're at. So if you took all that information and the chart with the declining enrollment and you followed the existing 2021 kindergarten through graduation, you'll get total elementary per high school. I did each of these by high school area because I can't <coughs> drill down into the elementary areas. And then we can project high school enrollments in 2031-32, which is not really a projection. You remember that chart that says all we're doing is following your existing students. So it's not really a projection. It's within three to five percent of the real number. So North Stokes, you go to 199, which is down from 300. South Stokes, 336, down from 528. West Stokes, 645, down from 761. So I'm going to kind of tie you together a little bit. If you look right now, this is in the North Stokes attendance area. And in North Stokes attendance area, you have Nancy Reynolds, Lawson Bowl, Sandy Ridge and you added the number of kindergartners, and it would be 66 in 21-22. These are the actual first, second, and third grades in blue. But we're going to follow that kindergarten class, and we're going to go to middle school, which is Piney Grove, 
same 66 students, plus or minus 5%, right, from the previous charts we looked at. And you roll that out, so it goes to 205 total middle school. They have 235 now. So you see when the decrease comes, it may not be huge in the north side of the county because you have a lot fewer students, 18% of your students. Then when you take that same 66 and you put them in high school, in year 3132, so this is the 3132, 10 years from now, same kindergartners entered high school in the north attendance area. You got the same students that are now in first, second, and third grade. Those are these students. And you've traditionally held the line pretty close within 5% all the way across the board. And that says North would have 260 students. Then you start to look that that's in that area. Then you're going to go down and look at, okay, you're going to lose four students to Meadowbrook. You're going to lose 40 students to early college, 216 subtotal. Then you're going to lose 17 students for 8% average graduation decrease. Gets you to 199 for North Stokes High School. That's within 5% in my calculations. There's not much forecasting in that number. We're basing it on where we're at. This is South Stokes. Same premise. 103 if you added Germanton, London, Pine Hall, Walnut Cove. This is the number of students, 103. You follow them into middle school. So you then have 312 in your middle school. You've got 395 currently in Southeastern. So you're going to go to 312. Then when you take the same kindergartners, 103, first, second, and third, <coughs> 435, take out 14. Meadowbrook, by the way, these are pretty real from your trends that I received from Stokes County data. 52 going to early college in this area. Your graduation rate, 9% for South Stokes, loss. Gives you 336 students. You have 528 today. So that will continue. Then you go to West Stokes. Same numbers, I'm just walking you through, but you can follow these through and talk with your constituents. This is 234 by adding King, Mount Olive, Pinnacle, Poplar Springs. It also has more kids, so hence it's the bigger number. You go to the same 234, which says 616. You currently have 640 in Chestnut Grove. Then we're going to go down to same numbers. You're going to take away your 23 to Meadowbrook, 76 to early college, and 9% takes you to the last 62 for graduation loss, 645 compared to your current enrollment of 761. So that kind of tells you where you're going in your, in your schools. So I don't expect you to look at these numbers. This just says red and green, this being west on the left, north in the center, and south on the right, and these are your special schools, which are early college and Meadowbrook. So if you look back in years 97, 2003, so you had growth, one, two, three, Four schools had growth. In your north, you had one school with growth, Lawsonville. And Walnut Cove was your only growth in <coughs> South Stokes. Now you notice down here, as you look at each year, you get more red and less green, so that the current year, you have Mount Olive had a 19% growth in the previous six years. And other than that, 
you had Walnut Cove with a four nut with a four percent. So those are the only two in your current year that had any growth. These are maintaining pretty steady. Maybe they had a little growth. And now, so we talked about this is existing in the red. So we're relating that to 12 year growth. This is current. And these are all negatives except for Walnut Cove over 12 years. Then I'm talking about the future. Now I'm going to go from West Stokes High School. This is high school, not attendance area. This is high school. You're going to go from a 24% loss to a 15% loss. So down in the area with more homes, more students, you're going to have less loss. It's still a loss. Then you go to North Stokes. And North Stokes in the previous 12 years had a 32% loss, call it 33. And this is forecasting. The number you saw on your sheet for 3132, which is 199 kids, it continues a 33% loss with that forecast. So it maintains the same loss rate. And if you look at your students and your five and unders, it shows the same example by darker color or lighter color. Now we go to South Stokes. Surprises you a little bit, surprised me too. Goes from 23% loss to 36% in the next 10 years. And that number is reflected in the forecast I have for South Stokes. The district as a whole, over here, the district as a whole in the last 12 years lost 21% of their students. And the next 10 says a 10.5% loss is a total district. So you're going to lose, but it'll be at a smaller rate than you have been losing. So maybe you're going to level out. Interesting data. I'm going to move now to square footage and building enrollment and talk about buildings a minute. So the previous chart with the reduced enrollment indicating students may house more students as you decrease enrollments, those schools could have more students should you or decide to shift the population. And the next one, if you looked at students per square foot, an indicator of schools that may be able to house more students, this gives an overall, it doesn't matter whether it's Stokes County or uh, Ash County or Wake, if you look at number of students per square foot, it kind of gets you a feel across the state of how you're doing, and then compare that to the state. So I'm going to move to talk about how the state works. Lots of numbers again. You have this sheet in your board pack that you can look at a little closer. And as you look, the school planning, this is Raleigh across the state, it defines schools in the large, medium, and small. So the gray area is the small. So south, north, and west, excuse me, north, south, and west, are all in the small high school category. And if you look at the colors in the next for square footage, you can say the top or enrollment changes colors, previous that you saw, yellow meaning somewhat neutral, and you have an increase in students. Now I'm going to move into buildings and go red says your short capacity. Yellow says your neutral capacity. The little brighter green meaning school capacity is available, and the darkest means you should have excess capacity. Now, this is just an indicator. It doesn't say that that's the real amount of kids you can put in a school. It says you've had that amount of kids in there, you sh you've lost some, you should be able to replenish it and still fit within your buildings. But what I'm looking at here, if you look at this chart as a whole, is these are both dark green, which is north and south. You've got a dark green at north. You've got dark greens at north. You've got one uh, says you have capacity, the lighter green. 
And that, by the way, is Sandy Ridge. I think that reflects some of the growth slides you saw earlier where Sandy Ridge may be getting a few more students. So they're not losing as many as the other two. And you go to South Stokes, and once you get to Ellen, you can see small, and this is middle. The state has them in large, medium, and small, with small being 475 students. Uh, you have, they're all small. And in the square foot per student, the, the state recommends square footage per student across here. This is state numbers, not mine. 167, a small middle school, 167 square feet per student. You are running 276, which is almost double that number. You're running 253. And you're running 161 square feet of student. So 161 being neutral down in uh, Chestnut Grove. And then as you move over your elementaries, the state has categories of large, medium, and small. I followed small down. You have one, two, three, four smalls, one medium, and one, two, three, four, five, six. And I, it's not a state term. Notice I said this is not a state term, but this is an ultra small school with less than 200 students. Most of them in the 100, you have the 153. Sandy Ridge is 171. <coughs> so you have a lot of ultra small schools, and I coined the phrase ultra small. There aren't many in that category in the state, but they're becoming more frequent. So as you look at this group and the square footage per student, the state says a small should have 138. In my experience is Title I schools have fewer students and more square footage as you get more programs. So this is my experience is bring it to 160 square feet a student. And you're at 468 square feet a student at Nancy Reynolds, 296, Lawsonville, 176, Sandy Ridge. And so you kind of get the drift of all of this, right? Don't need to go any further. So now I'm going to say, well, in the forecast where we're going, keep this in mind of 2030, 31, 32. So I added the green, I added this category at the bottom. So the north area will remain dark green. Didn't put it in elementary. I can't drill that deep without the census. And then I'm going to these again. You notice South Stokes became area, became a darker green in these. You got both dark greens, both dark greens. And these went from a neutral to a you know, you've got some room down in, uh, down in West. So this rolls between the two. So you see this one doesn't have the future. This one has the future in 31-32. Now I'm getting close to the end here. And I'm going to say when you evaluate school facilities and enrollment, the square foot per student is an indicator. I'm going to say that again, an indicator. It just says you need to look there. <coughs> but before you can determine what you can and should do, a thorough school building capacity review, classroom by classroom, considering the educational program the Board of Education wants to deliver, and you have to do that, meaning how many first graders, how many second graders, how many specials, what programs are you going to enter before you can determine how many students you can put in? The next step before repurposing a building and saying, well, this building is getting uh, a lot of your kids. You should do a complete facility assessment. You should look to see if renovation, maintenance, 
should, if you decide to do things with any schools, look to say you don't want to put your students into a building that's your oldest building in the in the county. If you got a newer building <laughs> that needs less maintenance. So those are considerations. You need to rely heavily on maintenance and your facility group. A possibility would be considering closing a wing or a hall could lower maintenance cost. Then you can have less cost per square foot, which means potentially you have precious dollars to another unfunded need. Now, this part, I didn't make this statement. The state 10, 15 years ago did a report on what is a small school district. What is a small school? In a local, this is right out of the state's report. A local school district must determine what school size best serves its students. Size, what programs, how the space is going to be used, and the size can be a compromise with student achievement, student and staff safety, road patterns, transportation, and distances, as well as effective utilization of the fiscal resources cost per square foot being one of those, as well as the local preference, local communities. So the state, I think this is a very powerful statement that this is the Board of Education's, this is your prerogative. You can do what you feel best for the community. So I'm gonna roll to the end. I'm gonna do a quick summary and then we can talk or you can talk. 50% of the student population in the southwest corner of Stokes County. Trends indicate births, kindergarten, and district en enrollment declines continuing, smaller, and six of 17 traditional schools have enrollments of less than 200 students. So this is the report of going where your enrollment's going. So at this point, it's really next steps, questions or next steps. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity, by the way. I hope this information is what you need. Thank you, Mr. Powell. I'm sure uh, the board may have a few questions for you. Okay. Um, one question that I had um, when you were talking about the uh, new construction, okay. that new construction doesn't always increase student population. Yes that uh, the larger houses the more expensive houses uh, a lot of times have people uh, that maybe don't have kids they're moving up yes um did you take into account what happens with a house that they move out of that's difficult to follow but if your population is not increasing it some of them are not used some of them may not have children we are focusing on children we're not focusing on uh, you know, a second home or a non-childbearing or something else. Right, but I know there's uh, several neighborhoods, especially in that West Stokes district, uh, that are older neighborhoods mm -hmm. that the housing may be in the 150 to 250 range, which mm -hmm. today is probably a starter home mm -hmm. for a lot of people. True. So if those people in those houses currently, uh, as you say, they uh, their jobs are a little bit better, their salaries increase, they move up and they get a larger house. Mm -hmm. So their houses they have now are not, you know, as I ride around, I don't see houses sitting empty. Uh, matter of fact, right now on the market, there's a shortage of houses. Uh, we can't, you know, a house goes on the market and it's sold in a matter of days. So even though those houses that, that are new construction being built, maybe four to 500,000 range, and then maybe they don't have children in them, the houses that some of those people are moving out of are starter homes that people may be moving into. And I know uh, Dr. Rice and myself had a meeting with a, a gentleman in King, and I think uh, he probably passed along the list to you uh, that uh, there's about 1,400 houses right now that are in the either on the books, developed, uh, in the planning stages, whatever, but the land is, I think, purchased mm -hmm. um, and they're ready to go. So, you know, conservatively, if we just have uh, 50% of those houses built out over the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, it just seems to me that that's a, that's a big influx of people coming in. And I don't see really where we're accounting for that. So we're still, you know, we're still declining in population or student population. 
and I don't see where we're really taking into account that those, you know, that new construction is going to be, I think uh, the King area will grow quite a bit in the next few years. Uh, it's a great question. And everybody in the county has that same question. And it's real interesting. I pop back up the youth age population behind you, which is this sketch. And it says an area in the, um, is this Mount Olive down here? No, Poplar Springs, where it has fewer under five year olds, which is the backfill of your schools for the next five years. And that population is decreasing. So that's a fact, it's there. The other thing that, as we looked over the past <clears throat> 20 years, that area has also seen a lot of large homes grow as illustrated by the darker colors in that area. <clears throat> but during that same time period, if you want to pencil some numbers down, in 2000, 2001, the West Stokes area had 1,634 students, still built houses from 2000 on, in 1213, you had 1,429. So you lost another 200, you lost 200 students in the period that you're building houses. And then when you go to 2122, and they're still building the houses, you've gone to 1,256 students in that same area. So it appears the trends and the data say that you can decrease in student enrollment even though you're building houses. Do you know how many houses have been built in the past 10 years in that area? I do not know the exact number. I trust the numbers from Stokes County. What was the number from Stokes County? He gave me a chart that didn't identify that. Let me, uh, I had to pull another set of data up, but I can get you that data. Um, just a comment. Straight out of the I wonder if a, you know, a piece of this also is the increase in competition within school choice in that part of the county. Would that not also pull away? It, it, although you have, you know, more young people, you also have a larger pool of choices over there, correct? Uh, yeah, did you have, is, profit, there, is there any consideration as to <clears throat> the decline? Is it just strictly from uh, a lower birth rate? And, and or is it, uh, are we losing kids to homeschool? We're losing to private school. I know you, you have in your list there that we're losing kids to, uh, you know, like West Stokes and South Stokes and North Stokes will be losing so many to Meadowbrook and to, um, and to uh, early, early college. college. But how many of those were we actually losing to the, to the uh, private schools or maybe homeschool? I can get you that data too, but generally the charter school in there is 140 to 190. Don't quote me on the exact number, which is not a huge portion of 1,200 students. So in your charter in that area. Now, if they're losing to out of county, you know, the millennium or something, you know, that's, but according to the state information, that's not a large percentage of the numbers. Uh, if, it's, if it's a lower birth rate, I don't know how much uh, success our board can have in increasing that birth rate. Um, yeah. But if it's uh, if we're losing kids to uh, homeschool to charter schools, uh, if it's our product that we need to work on, then yes, maybe we can work on that side of it. Those are excellent questions. I'm looking for the see if I can get my charter school. While you're looking for that, uh, I'll take you back to the slide that toward the beginning of the presentation that said factors that could affect trends. You know, and and I think that's what you're getting to, Mr. Robertson, was where you're talking about economic development, increasing job opportunities in the area. As the bypass around the northern part of Forsyth County is built, that may increase the bedroom community of Stokes County of access to Kernersville, access to other parts of the county. There may be, they may see that as an opportunity to come to Stokes County and be able to hit that bypass pretty quickly there in rural hall and make it somewhere faster than they used to be able to. So factors like that may increase um, tourism or housing in, in Stokes County, which, you know, that may be that bedroom community, school age child. It may be a little different than the last 10 years because of access, but that that's very difficult to project how many people 
would would do that but we do know that that Forsyth County has expanded east and west and you know they're working on the road to the north which may impact us I found the Stokes Charter enrollment this is state updated on September 24 2021 and it says 2021 had 150 students in charter schools from Stokes County is that the entire county? That's the county as a whole. Well, now, where those 150 students are, I don't know that, but there's 150. And you have a uh, school, private school down in your southwest also. What's that enrollment? 190, 170 to 190? It's less and than that's 200. Through 12 grades, so it's only 10 or 12 per grade students they they had a senior class a couple of years ago of four yeah so it's, it's, it's not, not a lot of kids percentage. for grade level at calvary mm -hmm. but they are building a new building but they are adding on yes I, and i understand there's going to be uh, when the new building is complete about 500 students in that school so that will almost double probably but still when you divide that out amongst the 12th the you know kindergarten through 12th grade not a huge difference in each grade and, and of the 500 students, if they have 500 students, not all of those students are probably going to be from Stokes County. Some Surrey, some mm -hmm. Forsyth. So once we get it, really break it down, it may not be a huge number for us. I did the 150 students divided, but you know, with the 1,256 students total in the Southwest only, and that's 11, 11 point something percent, 11.9, so call it 12 percent. Well, and when you look at transfers, we we receive right, 261 students from out of county, and we lose 105 to other counties. So if you're looking at attractability in that regard, we're getting over twice the students that we're losing currently to <coughs> other counties. Now, again, that does not account for homeschool. That does not where they don't have to. I mean, a student may be five year old and enroll in kindergarten. We may never know about them um, and, and all of that. So, but attractability, I, I feel good about the in county transfers right now that we're winning that, if you will. Can you say where most of those are pulled to? Can you break it down by? Well, we, we can certainly can pull it down by school. I mean, I don't have that information right now, but we, we have looked at that before. And again, normally it is in the where those other red areas are. And the primary reason for that is in the north, we can't pull from across state lines. And so the, the people that would live the closest to North Stokes, Piney Grove, those areas are out of state students. And we don't it's receive no dollars, no dollars. Correct. And so normally we're limited to in state transfers. So you might catch some from the edges of Surrey County and Rockingham, but the majority of them, I believe, are from Forsyth County in either King or Walnut Cove, those areas in the southern part of the county again. I was just definitely curious of the Rockingham County pool, you know, in that um, western Rockingham, that border. It, the last time we looked, it was not huge. In Pine Hall, it was a couple of kids, I want to say five or so. And Sandy Ridge, it was, I want to say less than 10. I, I, I don't have that number in front of me. I shouldn't say that. Would it be possible to get a now five, 10 and 15 year snapshot of what's coming in from out of county. Can we go back 15 years just to look? See if those numbers have increased. See if the numbers have increased and also we dropped tuition from out of county transfers to see if that benefited. I know at one point, two years ago, it had doubled. Ms. Slager, do you have that? In, but how far back do you have that information? Okay. Then we could look at that in comparison to where our enrollment numbers are and see if we're actively we're advertising correctly. Mr. Powell, I've always uh, kind of uh, felt like that uh, the schools is really a reflection of the health of the county. Would you would you agree with that? that uh, the schools kind of reflect what, and you kind of refer to that in your study that the, the population is aging. Mm -hmm. So is our, the health of our county is, if our county 
if our economic development is growing, if we have more jobs coming, more families moving, our schools are going to grow, right? Yes. And as our county, you know, if, if it's not growing, if a county is not growing, if we don't have industry coming, we don't have new jobs coming uh, to bring in those new families, really the only way we can grow is to build more houses and grow it by availability for people to live here. You'd have to draw incoming and give them a quality of life, yes. Right. Particular quality of life, which right. I think that's part of your goal. By the way, I pulled up, you know, but the numbers behind that chart, you saw all these numbers. This is every year, and as I indicated in the, a little bit ago, you are right at 100% transfer from year to year to year to year. So you're not losing, and I attribute Stokes County Schools having a good system, but you're not losing kids as you go along. You're maintaining the child, and the fact that you're entering ranging from 101 percent 102 102 96 94 you're really entering the children that are here other than those few 150 or so that may go to a charter you're entering them here so that's a tribute to your school system as a whole when you're you're getting them to begin initially and you're maintaining them you can't generate the child that isn't here as a board of education. But you have to adapt to where you're going as a county. <coughs> and the county as a whole, youth age is decreasing. And actually the working, according to that blurb, the working class is also decreasing. Were there... Were there any views taken on, because we're in a pandemic, I know personally of a neighbor who has just re-entered their three back into Stokes County Schools this past semester, but had held them out from the beginning of the pandemic. So were there any anomalies in the data that could have shown that we have more parents out there that chose that same path out of precaution until vaccine and masking or depletion of the <coughs> severity of the Omicron virus? That's a great question. It's a very thoughtful question. In 2021, you had 92% of the students. And in 21-22, you had 103%. So you saw a big jump between the two. And in the data, as I rolled it forward, I. I kind of negated the COVID effect in the future 10 years going, I'm hoping there isn't another COVID effect in there. Right. So you saw roughly a 10% drop from 103 to 93. Yes. On the birth rate versus entrance into school. Yeah. And you can follow that all the way through right. the chart. But your, your graph and trend numbers, did that equate to the 93% build or the 103 in Go back to historical 100%. Another great question. Let me look at the data. I have a good one today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to roll my <laughs> This does not show that <coughs> that 10% re-entered by the time they got, I'm looking across the board. And the other factor is I don't have the 20, 2022 23 to say how many came back next year. Right. So only have one year of trend between. Well, hopefully this is a, uh, a one more Omicron and done virus. <clears throat> yeah, the ninety-three to one hundred and three is only one year of data. Right. In order to see if it comes back, I'd have to have more than one year. Oh, I understand. Data. I'm yeah. just well, if these numbers are based on a ten percent <clears throat> reduction in enrollment on that one year, then. Well. Uh, but I did, but I did drop that COVID factor out in the future ten. Right. Okay. Uh, when you uh, talked with the planning in Stokes County, did they mention anything in the north eastern side of the county as far as development or anything? Because I was told about one of the biggest developing groups in Greensboro or Guilford County. Is bought between two and three thousand acres right on the Stokes and Rockingham County lines. A little bit in both counties. Yes. 
he mentioned that there's a developer that bought a significant piece of land and that could affect it a little more so it may say sandy ridge maybe sandy ridge can regenerate i don't know that answer right but sandy ridge has lost enough students that it can handle a significant amount right now my past experiences uh, i was for Scythe county for 22 years and did a lot of this in there and i've seen a lot of developments that were promised and I've also bought six 40-acre sites from developers that didn't make it. Land was very cheap for the school system to buy it. Mm -hmm. So just because they promise it doesn't mean there's enough money to say it's desirable enough to go in. Or if the economy changes, the economy could change and those developers then back out on their plans. Mm -hmm. you, it goes back to you need... Uh, youth or childbearing age and you need something to draw the childbearing age back to do work in a near typically in a nearby space have you did you look at any um uh trends in our child uh child care uh the daycare centers uh from that uh, birth to five years are those are those daycare centers declining as well or are they uh, holding their own or increasing? At, I did not look at daycares. I looked at schools. Because I think that could be an indication if it's uh, it, not only the birth, but maybe the people that maybe are moving in and have a smaller child. Uh, of course, there again, not all of them could be in that, Stokes County. but That is reflected in the zero to five population, though. Because they're not in school. That zero to five that's increasing in some areas and decreasing in some. That, whether they're in daycare or church or other or home and that, and that data that's, is from that's the, in that zero to five right? is that from the census uh, the county interpreted that from the overall census data which says a percentage if i could go to the quick facts on the website it's quick facts and there's a percentage of the total population in the census that says zero to five and so they pulled and did the mathematical calculation from that decreased amount of population. And then they went to the zero to fives and said of the population, that percentage is what's moving forward. So it's kind of close to that. I'm just not comfortable enough to say by census track this count. And that's not available. And that's part of the reason I tried to do a by elementary school but if you take that small factor and you say i'm based on a percentage of the total county population and then you hit another couple of factors about is this area growing or decreasing and you throw a factor in and then you throw a third factor in and pretty soon you're really just doing a shot in the dark <laughs> i'm not comfortable with that yeah i want to give you something that that you can look forward to well, and i want to be careful i want to be careful this is the ORAD study done in seven eight oh five oh six and in there that was before stokes county hit their total population growth and i'm going to go to an excerpt in there where they went to the county The ORED lab, ORED is the NC State University lab, reflected growth potential at the southwestern part of the county, especially the city of King, in order to revert the declining trend and to show growth potential in these areas, the ORED lab injected additional growth into the forecast model. It forecast that you would have 7,300 kids and you had 6,800. So their injected growth did not come to pass. So I don't want to do that again. I want to be careful with that. Mr. Powell, as the Board of Education and the County Commissioners work together for the next 20 to 30 years, 
you look at do you have enough building space to hold your students from your chart with the green areas it, it certainly looks that way that we have the space uh, then it becomes a thing of can you maintaining the facilities that you have uh, and age of facilities that you have at, at, and, and such my, my question is there anything that you saw of any indication that we would get back to the 7700 7900 that was there 10 15 years ago in, in anywhere going out in the future uh, I, I know you showed your trend lines but you know when you showed the actual lines there was rises and dips rises and dips is there anything that indicates that we could be facing something 20 years from now that that we're not predicting i can reflect on the state that has a projection based upon this is the uh, office of state budget management and they trend over years and they have trended this happens to be this happens to be age zero to 17 and this is from 2000 and it shows the increase that you had and then it shows it going down but it never returns back to that 7000 it never does this is zero to 17 and it drills a little deeper and this is the three to four year old and this shows an area and you have a little bump out here around uh, 2015. And this is again, three to four, which is now in your school system. Right. So this bump, this little bump is in your school and it shows it going down, but it never returns back to this pre-level of 1200 and you're dropping down to nine, 800 in this category. This is a state from 2000 to 2050. So this does not indicate we're going to, and it doesn't really matter what age group. So as a school district, we need to be prepared and a county to be prepared in the future to educate 5,000 students a year. You know, on, we don't need to look for 7,000. We need to, to properly maintain education for that 5,000 or so uh, moving forward. I think if you're in that range in 20 years, you're going to do just fine. The biggest trick is where is it going to be? Right. Which is why the lighter and darkers of the growth and no growth. And you can see those two side by sides. To me, those are powerful side by sides. But that tells you that you're most likely in the southwest, some to the south central, some to the north and east, but it's not likely northwest or deep southeast and again that's barring something that we don't know about you know if mm -hmm. up in the northern area if they put an amazon facility and did mm -hmm. you know if something like that came in in 10 years that would certainly skew all of this if you get something like that going on it'll skew the area yeah but without predicting that it looks like we're the size we are if or I'm, a in little my bit past less histories if you had i'm gonna go from memory now <clears throat> That if you had a starter home, you may have an average of two or 2.3 students per house in a starter home. So it's not big. It's two to 2.3. And if you go to the 200 <coughs> to 300 range, you're in the 0.9 to 0.7 students per house. That's students now. So you're not talking massive. And if you bring in a thousand jobs, is that a thousand homes? Probably not. Maybe it's 500, maybe it's two. So you potentially, that'd be in a real tall end, but I, there's no way I'd go back in light of what happened that ORAD said, I'm gonna inject some growth. Right. And it may have, uh, it didn't come to pass. Or the, um Numbers you're seeing in Stokes County and our situation here, a little bit decline in population, aging population. Is that unique to Stokes County or do you see that in a lot of rural areas? That's a great question. It's all rural areas in the state, but I think that that's general knowledge. I think all rural areas are decreasing in population, holding even to decreasing. If you look at your neighbor, Surrey, they're, they're holding pretty steady on their students. I don't know about Rockingham. I didn't look at theirs. 
and didn't look at their general population. Guilford is growing, but obviously they got industry and business. Yeah, I think Surrey and Rockingham both are a little, a little maybe different than a lot of rural areas. They do have a couple major highways that go through their counties, mm -hmm. uh, where a lot of rural rural counties do not have that. Stokes included. So um, I think you know that's uh, they're a little bit out of the out of the mold for that. But um, and Surrey's growth is following fifty two seventy four. Absolutely, you, it's obvious, isn't it? And then you got the Elkin Corner over on there, which is toward the mountain tourism. Mm -hmm. And Highway seventy seven is through there. Mm -hmm. 77 not as much because the mountain park up there i know that intimate knowledge and it's holding in the 100 to 130 kids but it's a massive area like a couple of your areas of the county when you think it's a massive quadrant mm -hmm. so the school district and the county committed they didn't want to transport those students for an hour and a half on a school bus mm -hmm. So that you'll have some of those situations that, <coughs> that you have to deal with. Well, with uh, any, is there any other questions? I've got one. As we, and this is crystal ball time, as we saw <coughs> Guilford develop their infrastructure towards the northern side, we saw Oak Ridge explode and we saw Summerfield explode. Mm -hmm. Is there any conjecture as to what? And again, this is just what you perceive the county doing. Uh, what that's going to do as this Forsyth County loop that will intersect Highway 8. So we're looking at the Germanton area, uh, maybe Walnut Cove, but they'll get to Germanton first and then drop off at Real Hall. And that makes it more convenient to King, which I mean, the, the interchange near the airport is 10. It's roughly the same distance Rural Hall to King, Highway 8 to Germanton as it is in Oak Ridge and we saw it explode. Is there any, in your experience, I'm, thinking, I'm not asking, I'm, for, yeah, I'm, I'm not asking for data, I'm asking for a general trend or perception from somebody that does this. And my expression is drawing from back within. Yeah, well the so mask is hiding back, the I'm facial expression, so it's making it, you know. Can I? Can any interpolation be made? Or, yeah, yes, there's so many trends. A couple surprised the country in the last 15 years with the reurbanization, and that changed more from cities growing outward to cities coming back inward. And so, urban environments as the younger youth, uh, childbearing age grew inward, then there were less suburban homes, and now the home market is busted because there aren't enough houses for sale in the suburban environment. COVID sent everybody out. They went their own little white picket fence. That has led to some of the home shortages. Now, will that trend change? I don't know how to forecast that. I didn't see the reurbanization coming, but it's there, isn't it? All the cities are, Durham, dead, Winston-Salem, you know, all of those, they're now vibrant center city communities well what i'm will, seeing, so will that trend move out to say will an area in adjacent to that belt line pop i'm gonna say maybe not unless the jobs come with it well what i'm seeing just in the people i work with or come in contact with they all went urban and then when they had their kids they wanted out of the cities for the safety factor mm -hmm for the lower crime rates for the more rural environment which would post poise well for stokes county yeah but yeah. then again that's optimism overriding pessimism and i, and I think that is a good possibility but will it be enough to tip over your loss of 2,000 students in the last 20 years. Well, I'm not thinking it's going to come back, but we've got a plan for what the Stokes County is going to look like yeah. 20 years from now, not two years from now. We've got to keep our eye on that. yes. Yeah. Yes. Difficult to forecast. Okay. Well, Mr. Powell, thank you. You did a great job. It's uh, very valuable information for the board. I think it's going to take us a little more time to digest all of it. 
We may have yeah. future questions, uh, but uh, great, uh, great job you did. Great presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, if we do uh, come up with some more questions, we may uh, have Dr. Rice back in touch with you. But, uh, but uh, for now, it's going to take us a little while to to review all this and digest it. But uh, we we thank certainly you. thank you for coming in. Thank you for your time, and especially thank you for your trust. I appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Okay, let's take us a five minute recess. <coughs> Morning coffee. <laughs> <laughs>
Still missing a board member. Your cohort. Ms. Barker, we've had some uh, uh, reports that our, our sound and uh, picture quality is not the best today. Would it help if people made sure that their microphones were closer, or is it some other technical issue where it's just muting out? This may be a discussion we need to have at a later time, but do we need to upgrade our equipment, or is it the equipment fine? Is it just... Okay, let's try to work on that. Just check on that and give some estimates. Okay. So, uh, call a meeting back to order. Uh, we're at a discussion agenda uh, item B, a discussion of the uh, WAN bid and timeline. Uh, Ms. Barker. Okay, good morning. Um, I want to go over our WAN bid information and just tell you kind of the research I've done on this so far. Um, in your packet, I've shared with you the bandwidth reports. So in, in gathering information for the WAN bid, that is a category one, which is E-rate. Um, and E-rate money pays for that for us, thank goodness. But um, so I've collected the bandwidth, band, uh, bandwidth reports that are shared in your packet. I went through and just kind of to give you a gauge because um, for the high school, for example, the um, 250 was the most megabits per second that was used for the month of November. Um, for the middle school, the most was 140, greater, a little bit greater than 140. In the elementary schools, it was... Um, 50 was the most, a little bit greater than 50, which was the most used. I wanted to share with you, because when, um, all right, okay, there it is. Just to show you a gauge of what it looks like, I went through and put the max used, um, and behind you you'll see on that chart. So the max used per school in the month of November, this is all, um, all the numbers I just called out to you. So all sites with the max number. And if you'll look on the North Stokes right here is the highest one during the month of November. And it's at 250. We are requesting one gigabyte in our bid, in our RFP. I did put the option of also bumping it up to two with more remote, more tech coming. I felt like if we could ask for that, um, all of our tech team, like in researching, I examined our backups. Our backups runs at five and seven. So it runs on site at five, then ships off to off site at seven. So it did not impact the gigabytes used or, or our <clears throat> megab megabits per second. I met with NITOR and our techs to ensure that our bandwidths were sufficient and um, Met with our DPI E-rate person to go over the RFP with me, shared it with Fred. Fred suggested some edits, made the edits. But I want to show you the different, like when you think of one gigabyte, if I were to change, for example, if I were to change Germington, let's say Germington used one gigabyte, so 1,024. Look at the difference. So there is one gigabyte <coughs> here. And of course it made the chart with the top being changing that significantly. So we are nowhere near the one gigabyte. Well, that's November. What about during testing time? Because November is already on a shortened month due to the holiday. It is a shortened month, and um, but it did have some normal days in there as well. And then the holiday right before peak holiday, typically our bandwidth goes up during 
right before holidays with teachers um, showing videos and sharing things. So I did do that. Um, I will reach out to get testing since we just had it this past December. If you would like me to share that as well. Did we test elementary also? No. We, so we need to look back at EOGs last year. But we don't have full EOGs with full testing until the spring. And even at that point, middle and high school, elementary, middle, do it at one window and high school does it in another window. Uh, but, well, you know, high the, school use, you know, last month would be available though. Right. Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm just more concerned Poplar Springs, not all of King Elementary, when you've got 450 kids all testing what that well it would just be half their kids because it's three four and five okay uh but but still that that would give probably the max usage but again it's nowhere near it's again nowhere near. <coughs> yeah. okay it's nowhere near um that is, i just wanted to is do this that. Uh, is this for the whole month or is this just peak days that's the whole month but i did pick out on in your chart you'll see or in your packet you'll see i just i picked out the highest one i went through and kind of gauged the most the max used for the month of November and just plugged it in so you would see where we are and when you you know when I changed that to the one gigabyte I mean we're we're significantly far away from the one gigabyte I, I punched it back into the normal so one is there any 10, reason why North Stokes was so high that one month I have I don't have an answer for that, but it was unusual that they were so much higher than the other two high schools. Mr. Rose, could that be attributed to North Carolina Virtual Public School? Those type options electronically? I mean, I'm, I don't know, but I know that in the past, when we've not been able to offer a section face to face, they've used that option. Where? Well, I'm glad so we're using it. I'm just wondering why theirs was what South and West was combined. Where we're able to offer more face-to-face -face with Forsyth Tech because we have enough to make a class. We do more remote options there. I can't say that that is the reason, but that's one that jumps to mind. Right. Or Mr. Fulp or CTE classes could have been doing something significant there as well. Questions on that difference in that makes? How far off we are i just want to show you that visual of what that was um so like i said i've i met with the dpi consultant we reviewed our rfp shared it with fred he reviewed it we made um corrections and revisions and it's posted so that leads me to the timeline um and this the, the timeline is a cheat note for me um it gives me a gauge it gives you all a gauge of what where we're headed. Um, the 470 had to be put into E-rate, which is the procurement vehicle for E-rate. So I have to put that in E-rate. So once it put in the was placed in the newspaper, that's when I had to do, I had to file the 470 form. Um, so then our deadline to our responders, technical questions. So any questions they are to submit to me e by email is January 14th by 12 o'clock p.m. And then I'll get with our team to make sure we have proper answers by January 18th and post those on the website. Um, the bid is due February 7th. We originally had February 1st, but with our 28 window, Fred and I decided that to be more conservative, that we should push it out to the 7th. The bids will be opened on February 7th. That gives us a chance to go through and have a final evaluation. I've I'm going to reserve a day for February 15th for our tech team to evaluate the bids, to make sure it's in the in the bids at everything we are asking for and covering everything that we are needing for to be effective for our county. Um, the contract award will be, we I think we have a board meeting the 21st and then so that we will decide that night and then the notification to the vendor will be the next day. Um, I, I wasn't sure on the protest deadline. This is the first time I've did the WAN. Um, so I reached out and our consultant said a week or so is typically given to the vendors unless your district does not have a protest policy. I reached out to Freddie, said that he was not aware of a specific protest policy. Um, signed the contract should be signed within two weeks. And then I have to file the 471 within E-rate. And that deadline is March 27th that that must be filed.
So now is, is this, um, I know with our interactive boards, we kind of got information on our bids. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much we got them, <clears throat> excuse me, we got them at the meeting. And then uh, we're looking to make a decision, you know, right after we kind of just had all that information in front of us. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be the same way? Are we going to be able to, is the board going to be able to well, our receive our evaluation the information day, and then review it before we have to make a decision on it? Well, our evaluation day is the 15th. So I would give the information, our our rubric information to you all after the 15th. That, that Hopefully at the end of that day. Okay. And is our, that our meeting is when? 21st. Okay. Correct? Yes. So you think you'll be able to get it out on the 15th or is that going to be review it and then put it all together and we get it on the 19th if the 21st is on a Monday? We get it on the 18th on that Friday. I mean, that's only three days past the 15th. Our plan is to come up with a um, go through it that day. Well, and it depends on how many days we may have to bump that sooner than the 15th if there are. Because the, many... the, the opening of the bid is what, the 7th? Yes, sir. So we're, we're waiting a week or a week and one day from we'll the opening until we review those. it. We'll be going through those. And then I've asked for a digital copy. I don't know if you noticed that in the RFP. So when we do get it, I can submit that to you all. Um, I mean, we can bump that 15th up, certainly. But we'll be going through that. And you will have the information in advance of the meeting. Yes, sir. Because if we don't get it until the... 18th and we're probably not going to make a decision on the 21st okay i can move it up the grading matrix has it been finalized we're going to discuss that during closed session uh because we've been our e -rate e -rate, ask us not to make that public they they have recommended even before me um that that like in your in the rfp not to put the rubric just list the qualification that you are seeking, and then the rubric is something that you have separately that it's not posted in the RFP. But I, I have that completed as well, and it should be in your packet, the rubric. It's supposed to be in your packet. Mr. Johnson, a question is, uh... They're going to come up with a recommendation, I think, from their review. Are we bound to that to recommendation, or, do, or is the board making our own decision? In the previous year's contract, Mr. Chairman, the, the board developed their own rubric for what, what we deemed as actual necessity. Well, I would just uh, like it if we could have, you know, have that and have some time and and we may even have to have some discussion on that before we award that contract. It is a it's such a, a big contract, a big deal for us. So Absolutely. I just don't want it to, to fall into that category that we had before where, um, you know, we were kind of presented with a lot of information at one time with no time to really digest it and then kind of expected to put it over to action and make a decision and. Uh, when, that, when that information, I think, had been in-house for a couple weeks. But you'll have the information. The, well, I've, I've requested the digital, digital format, so opening day we'll be downloading that information and sharing with Fred and you all to make sure with from Fred that we've got it's correct. On the 7th, you mean? Yes, sir. Okay. Absolutely.
Okay. All right. Any other questions from the board? We also need to mention the R or discuss RFP with Fred during closed session. Right. That's what I think Dr. Rice mentioned. Well, that, that was the WAN matrix, but we need to talk about this request for proposal with enclosed with the attorney client. I'll explain more later. Okay. Any other questions from Ms. Barker? Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> We'll move now to uh, item C, discussion item C, uh, discussion of state budget impact. Ms. Moore. Hey, I've had laryngitis for two days, so I'm gonna try to do the best I can. If I end up with no voice, I'm gonna look at Dr. Rice and Mr. Jones then to kind of help <laughs> me out. But I'm not sure how it's in your packet, but some of this information I had shared with you earlier, it was kind of combined with the legislative salary increases and the bonuses. In this situation, I pulled them out separately. Your legislative salary review is just basically giving you the information that the state approved by different categories. And I've included the salary schedules where you could see, for example, on the teacher scale, by years of experience, what the percentage of increase was because some receive more of an increase than others, and you can see that by different salary schedules that we've attached behind uh, that information. Then from there, we need to talk a little bit about bonuses. We Most of the bonuses they have referred to us trying to pay in January, so we're busy trying to figure out what we need to do, plus we're still receiving information from DPI. We have already paid, as you know, the state premium bonus where our employees received either $1,000 or $1,500 in December before the holiday, and that was us employees. We also have the one-time bonus for teachers and instructional support. Some of the key factors to some of these bonuses, and I put that in red in a lot of situations, they will only pay for it if it's a person paid for state funds, which means that we have to find funding then if we we're paying, for example, teachers and instructional support from local and federal funds, we have to find uh, funding to support that. So in a lot of cases, when you look down, you will see where I noted in red, it talks about state funds only. When we go down to the third item there, the advanced course for our, our teachers on examinations, we actually have on our AP, we have just received that information. We have 11 people and their information that they will, the amount they will receive ranges. Some will get 100 up to 550. On the CTE bonus, we've received that information now. We have nine people and that ranges from $25 to $2,100. And these people will be recognized, I'm sure, a little bit later on with the board. And we do plan to pay that to our employees in January. There's a low wealth signing bonus that has to, can be up to a thousand dollars and this is another one. It's state funds only but it requires a local match which means that we would um, if we pay the ones that's paid for state funds we would do a match on that. That goes back to teachers that were hired from and from July 1 and still employed as of October 1. And I had Melissa go back and look, and during that time we had 33 people that could possibly be eligible for this particular bonus. The one-time principal bonus, which is $1,800, hopefully we'll be paying that in January. And all of our principals are paid from state funds. We would not have to worry about that one hitting local dollars. The one-time teacher instructional support, again, state funds for uh, any type of COVID training, it's $1,000. I attached the survey in your information to let you see what the staff sent out to allow our teachers and instructional support employees to complete the different trainings that they have completed. We are receiving that information and are down to, I think, about 30 employees that we yet lack, and Dr. Rice contacted each one of those individually. So uh, our survey would be our documentation when we're audited that uh, they qualified for this, this particular bonus. 
we do have to put in an application and fill out a federal grant in order to receive <coughs> that particular bonus. And then also we're receiving more information on this one. It's the state funded teaching instruction support supplement for state, federal, and local positions to help with our 5% local supplement. And it shows that we're that would be $1,827. DPI is still giving us additional information on this particular one. And again, that only covers your state teachers, funded teachers, and instructional support. It does not include all of your employees. We also had an ESSA grant for school nutrition, and it was decided that one is our retention bonus. And they have been told by Mr. Jones that we will pay that in May for those who stay with us during this uh, time of COVID. And it will range from $700 for a full-time employee and prorated out on the amount of hours that they work. Have you any questions on that information at this time? Or one question uh, I'd like to take your attention to page two on the bonus review section at the top of that page she mentioned that there is a low wealth signing bonus for teachers hired after july 1st and still employed as of october 1st right now we know that is a one-year amount the my thought and and we've not found anything to back this up yet is that this will be a recurring thing because it says if you take it now you're not eligible again to receive it until 2024 yes which makes me think that this is going to be a recurring thing but they don't want somebody coming to stokes this year going to yadkin next year going to surrey the next year and every year collecting us bonus that you only have it for one time for several years as she said this is a matching bonus the state has said we'll pay up to a thousand dollars but if stokes county says we only want to put in fifty dollars a teacher then they would match fifty dollars the teacher would get a hundred if we put in a thousand they will put in a thousand they would get a two thousand dollar bonus as she said there were 33 teachers that would qualify for that this year so if the board wants to proceed with this we would need to discuss that and have a board action because that will be a thirty-three thousand dollar impact to the budget this year and potentially could have an impact moving forward um it doesn't have to be decided today but it would need to be decided at our next meeting the 24th but i, I want to make sure that we've explained that fully uh and i know miss moore's fighting a voice this morning so i kind of want to just explain that miss moore anything anything extra the only other thing is we might could look at some of our other extra monies like that prc 181 that the board has put in for the windows and the air and we did not hire as many technology folks so there is some extra money there so instead of hitting our local dollars for this coming year it's possible we could you know revamp that ESSER grant if the board chose to do that for that that's another option we could look at Any thoughts from the board conversation about that item? Uh, would there be any downsides or negatives to going about the ESSER way? It would not affect anything that the board has approved at this time due to the fact, like I said, uh, we did not hire as many technology positions. The downside would be the money carries over. If you all wanted to look at that money going to another way for example additional technology or other items you would have the choice to do that to use it for other things so that money does not run out this end of june low wealth is a category there's several school systems that are in that due to their local tax base tax yeah. dollars the state has designated low wealth districts and so we are stokes county is one of those districts that has been labeled a low wealth district from the state and we are the districts that qualify for this money and to give you an example counties like forsyth and guilford would not get low wealth funding we get uh over two million dollars of low wealth funding that basically we use for positions now besides this 
So it was trying to say, they're trying to say that to get our, like our 5% supplement more in line with these larger counties, that that would help do so. You said there's how many would be affected by that? 33 this year. It's in the yellow. <clears throat> and it is only instructional teachers, correct? It's, it's Te teachers and yeah. mm -hmm. it would not be a, if a bus driver was no, hired no. or a cafeteria. Right. It, and, and that is a couple of things I, I do want to make sure that the board understands. One of the items I'm very happy about in one way and not happy about in the other is on page three. The state funded teacher instructional support supplement for state, federal, and local positions to help support our 5% local supplement. The state looked at the amount of local supplements that each individual districts offer. And to try to help districts that didn't pay as large of a supplement, competitive with districts, surrounding districts that may pay more, they offered a supposed to be continuing supplement but it's only for instructional staff. So, and we have been very intentional, Stokes County, but before I was, got here till now, that we have an employee supplement, that every employee, regardless of your category, receives the same 5%. And we, I, I believe that was done intentionally to show that we value all of our employees, um, but this is a differentiated supplement. So I would not receive this supplement. A custodian would not, an office support wouldn't, uh, a director would not, um, but it is only for um, teachers and instructional support. And so while everyone else receives a 5%, they would re receive this state supplemented um, supplement. And so that does change <clears throat> our supplement schedule, if you will. I mean, locally, it's still the same, our save 5%, but it, it does differentiate a supplement. And, and that would be the first time that I'm aware of that that's happened in Stokes County. So I just wanted to make sure that's you do understand that. I did have one quick question. Is everything listed on page one um, with the salary information and the red the side of it? It is all reflected as far as that dollar amount. It's I'm sorry. Whether it be assistant principals, is that dollar amount overall reflected? And then principals and central office, is it yeah. all reflected here in the packet? I just say it should be. Okay. <coughs> Okay, any other questions for Ms. Moore? Okay, okay. thank you. Thank part you, of, feel better. Thank you. Part of this is also is in here is the packet that you had at your desk this morning uh, for school nutrition and bus drivers, uh, where it is, it discusses this on page two of the, at the beginning of the packet, that certified or non-certified, classified slash non-certified staff receive the greater of a 2% or whatever it takes to achieve the minimum wage of $13 an hour, beginning effective July 1st, 2021. And then they also was in the legislation that starting July 1st of 2022, they would also receive a 2.5% increase or a $15 minimum per hour next year. So with that being said, we have developed, uh, Mr. Jones, Ms. Moore and myself have looked at developing a new salary schedule, and I, I'll turn it over to Mr. Jones to, to discuss that, or Ms. Moore, if, if you'd like to, to talk about that as well. Before he starts, I will say to you all, our school nutrition workers, one group that we have never put on scale by years of experience, and this will allow that once he goes over that, to put them on by years of experience like other classified groups have been. It's just, they are, in a, their funding sources are different. And the other thing that I will add before he starts to this too is with school nutrition, their funding sources, as you know, to generate funds, they're very limited. So more than likely with this, if we approve and adopt, 
uh, these scales, it is going to require that it will probably hit local funding because, as you know, they had like 87 thousand, I think it was, fund balance this past year, which was excellent. But COVID funding helped make that possible. So, I'm just I want the board to be aware that when we do our local budget, we will probably have to add additional funds to support the salaries and so forth for school nutrition. Go ahead. Well, and, and just to reiterate what she said there, that as, as you recall, school nutrition is an enterprise fund where it is supposed to be self-sustaining. And they've been able to do that in the past with what we charge for meals, what we're paying for food, and what we are paying employees. This is a significant increase in employee cost. And so without doing a significant increase in food cost, I mean, paying for the food right now, which, you know, we're, we're only limited in what we could go up per year, but we're certainly not going to expect to go up on the price of lunches and breakfast right now to match these employee costs right now. <laughs> Our end of the year data could look a lot different than it's looked in the past and moving forward. But, Dr. Mr. Jones? Sure. Well, as Ms. Moore mentioned, we are thankful that the state finally took action to increase the minimum wage for our classified employees um, that would take effect now and then again move to $15 an hour come July 1 of 2022. As you mentioned also, school nutrition employees have not been placed on a scale um, that valued their years of service, and so that was important to us to, uh, to make sure that we were rewarding our folks who are hanging around and are, are loyal to Stokes County Schools. And so you can see there on the, the first sheet, school nutrition workers and bus drivers, the 2018-19 hourly rate is based on transportation. <clears throat> and then you can see the 21-22 hourly rate jumps to the $13 minimum that Ms. Moore had mentioned. And then you can see the different levels and, and the scales. That is the state assigned minimum and maximum for those categories. Um, and so I feel like this will definitely put money, more money in the pockets of our classified employees. And then we will move to the $15 an hour starting in July 1 of 2022. And looking at the cafeteria manager's salary schedule, prior to this schedule, I don't believe, Ms. Moore, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there was no jump from the cafeteria worker to the cafeteria manager position. The hourly rate was the same for a starting manager, uh, which, as you can imagine, is hard to entice someone to want to take on those additional responsibilities uh, for no more compensation. So we have started the level one cafeteria manager at $14 per hour. And you can see the different levels there and years of experience that go along with that. Be happy to take any questions. Ms. Moore, please feel free to jump in if I left anything out on that. That's good. The only thing is when we talk about the state approving these increases like mandating the 13 and 15, and like for example, when we receive our state allotments, they, they adjust those allotments. But even though they've mandated this in the area for school nutrition, there, there, are, there would need no adjustment. That's the reason I was trying to stress to the board that even though that mandate's there, there's not additional funding necessarily coming down to meet that mandate. And you can see in uh, yellow, we went back to show what it would cost <coughs> based on their paid for 200 days and what it would cost based on the 13. And then in the blue, if we were doing the 15, what that would cost to kind of give you an idea of what that would look like. The third page in that <coughs> packet explains the substitute pay rates that is listed on page two. Um, uh, again, the minimum salary should be $13 an hour. Uh, the guidelines are listed there, the no retro pay uh, back to July 1st, 2021. For licensed, the state gave a range of a minimum rate of 105 to 161 and for unlicensed, a rate of 81 to 161. When you look at the minimum rates, what our recommendation is, is the third section there for, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth section there for licensed uh, to go to 123 and unlicensed 100. And when teacher assistants are used as subs to 179, uh, this would use the minimum daily rate for a teacher assistant of 104.81. So this is how those 
parts would be play out when we actually look at the actual dollars. Using and the I know the board had talked about a substitute rate increase, and this would have would allow that. Uh, I just kind of run some history this weekend, and I went back to 2019 because of COVID in the other years, and it equaled out over 4,000 days of subs that we paid in 2019, just to have that information. And again, if you hear questions of, well, when am I going to get just in general from employees my retroactive pay? Because as you know that uh, we've started out until allotments dropped, paying people at the old scale and in all categories. So there has to be a software change statewide in order to work out retirement uh, for these uh, all of our employees. We're waiting on that software change. As soon as it comes in, we do have up to March from the state saying to make a retroactive pay. We will do everything we can once that change comes in to get the retroactive pay to our employees. I do not know if it will come in in time in January, but if it does we'll do that, and like I said to you earlier, we are going to try to do as many bonuses as that we know we can and, and obtain the money in the month of January, in case you questioned. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Moore. Thank you. Oh. Okay, we'll move on now to uh, uh, item D, discussion agenda item D, uh, discussion of policy 8000 series. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, the 8000 series, primarily the changes there are just updates or to correct, correct uh, so a couple of typographical issues. There are three items that I do wish to address. And the first one is 8210, the administrative procedure 8210. That administrative procedure deals with the Nancy Jane Cox Reynolds School Endowment Fund and how the accounting for that fund uh, will be completed and the board's oversight of that accounting. That administrative procedure was adopted on September 12 of 2005. Uh, I think at, at this point, it, it would be good for uh, the uh, administration, uh, finance department, and to consult with the uh, advisory committee appointed for the Nancy Jane Cox uh, endowment to determine if we do need to make any changes in that administrative procedure since it's been 15 years. The other one I wanted to point out is 8320. Uh, as indicated by the School Boards Association, there is a typographical error in that policy. This is the policy where the board designates uh, official depositories for school funds. Um, and I have corrected that typographical error, and I will have the new policy to present uh, at the uh, next meeting. The third item to address is 8350. Now that's also an administrative procedure unique to Stokes County where the board has established useful lives for capital assets. For example, we've listed buildings at 70 years, automobiles at five years. That has not been modified also since 2005. So I'm thinking that uh, with the uh, uh, buildings and grounds department, uh, we need to look at that and determine if we need to adjust that. It, it, it's based pretty much on uh, recommendations from the local government commission so I think, you know, since it's been 15 years, we probably need to check that one out also to determine if we need to modify that. Will you have, uh, will you update these and have recommendations for us? Yes. At our next meeting? Yes. I do have one question. 
uh, just for my own personal information, uh, you were talking about the endowment for the uh, Nancy Reynolds School. What do you know specifically what that covers, what it pays for? As it was initially provided in the will of Nancy Cox, it was to go for build for grounds primarily. <coughs> Gosh, I'm going to date myself. I can't think of when it was, but it's been probably about 15 years ago. There was a court proceeding to modify that because, you know, there was really more money coming in to that endowment that could be spent on the grounds themselves. So it was expanded to give the committee the authority to use it not only on the grounds, but on the buildings also. And there's a committee that's uh, appointed to determine how to, how to uh, use those funds. The problem with, that we had under the, the tax ramifications, they had to spend at least the interest every year to maintain the, the tax-free status. And there was even a problem with that. So that's... That's why it was expanded as to the number of uses <coughs> for that money. Now, is that committee that you're speaking of, is it local? Board appointed. So the, this yeah. board appoints that committee? Do we do that on a yearly basis? or? I think it's the same committee has been in effect for a long period of time. There's some automatic members on that, like the principal is always a, a member of the committee. Um, they're faculty members, but they're also parents and general members of the com of the community. So the committee That's does the change on a on a, not necessarily a yearly basis, but it does change on a reg somewhat regular basis. It, it changes primarily from the principal side and the teacher side, but uh, I, and I'm not sure who the other members of the committee are uh, at this time. So can we use money from that endowment for uh, uh, improvements or repairs to the building, say for a roof? We can on the Nancy Reynolds, but yeah, it has to be for Nancy Reynolds. Right. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, Dr. Rice can tell you, I guess better than I can, but there's always been some um, uh, friction with the committee about that because their position is whatever capital expenses go for the other schools, Nancy Reynolds should share equally in that. So therefore don't use our money for what is basically a school district uh, obligation. So that's, didn't you just say that that was a, a court a hearing that determined that that uh, can go from the grounds to the uh, capital projects? Was that not determined in court? Is that what you said? Yeah, it, it, it technically, could we do it? Yes, but there's been some reluctance uh, <laughs> to do that because, because it of sounds committee, like it would have to community have opposition. Committee's approval, yeah. and if they want to approve it, then we can't per se override any of that. So the board's think. not able to force their Correct. approval. Right. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, any other uh, questions for uh, Mr. Johnson on uh, the uh, Policy 8000 series? I'm good. Okay. We will uh, look for those uh, changes and uh, probably be on the action for the next meeting, I'm uh, guessing. Yes, sir. Okay. <coughs> uh, discussion agenda item E, discussion of COVID-19 update. Dr. Rice. Board, I have not updated the data from last week with this being a morning meeting. Uh, you can see there where we were as of last Monday. Uh, I would like to point out that the vaccinations as of last week were over 1,000 for our school-age students in the county, about 1,100. Mm -hmm. And so I do believe that the board's decision to put off the masking optional practice allowed people to do to get vaccinated if they chose to. And so I, I appreciate your wisdom and foresight in that. I will say that as of today, we are still masking optional in all of our facilities. Um, there, as you voted in a couple of changes earlier today, 
uh, I'll take you back to the consent agenda. There are slight adjustments to our practice. Uh, one, I, I, in the original one, I said that we would pull the data at noon each day and share it by one each day. Um, that was not very bright on my part. Uh, things happen. Um, I, I have meetings scheduled at one o'clock, and so I gave myself a little window from one to five to post it. Again, with the goal of more closer to one than five, and then just afternoon each day so that it would be there. And also the la very last um, bullet point, if a student's required to wear a mask under the current requirements, they must wear a mask regardless of the school status. And this includes after school activities. As you're aware from last week, the health department, um, the state has provided new guidance that the quarantine rules have shortened. They've gone from 10 days to five days if you're fever free and symptoms are approving, you can come back to school with a well-fitting mask. Did I get all of the, <laughs> the, the, the parts into that? Um, which is going to help us tremendously with our quarantine numbers. And, and before, I mean, if you remember back when this began, it was a 14 day automatic quarantine. And so then it was reduced to 10 and now it's been reduced to five and then follow up with the mask. And so even though we have had more cases recently, because they come out of it quicker, it's not affected our numbers as, as bad as it could have. Uh, so we are still mask optional. We do not, we had one school this morning in the 4% range, um, but none are in the 5%. So uh, again, this is another short week, if you will, which is going to, help us get over this holiday surge. Uh, last week, uh, we were already on a work day on Monday and had the day out Tuesday due to the power outages. So we had a three day week last week. We'll roughly have a three day week this week. We'll have a four day week next week. And so I'm hoping that that holiday surge that we've had, will be able to manage that effectively and, and keep people in school as much as possible. Um, uh, the obvious things that I know you're you're probably asked about or wondered about is the county did have a significant increase last week, um, as our schools did as well. But um, again, it was manageable due to the, the shortened quarantine times that we didn't have massive number of students out of school. Are there any questions? Any questions? So you're saying return after five with the well-fitting mask. How long is that for? Another five? Day. I'm sorry. Returning with a mask is five more days. Yes, sir. If you're fever free and your symptoms are approving, if you still have a fever, we go back and readjust that and, and <coughs> we add a, a day to every day that you still may have symptoms. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Uh, discussion agenda item F, discussion of 2022-2023 traditional calendar. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Board Chair. Board members, <clears throat> at your workspace, you should have there in your board packet the 2022-23 calendar proposal as well as legislative requirements and a summary of the calendar proposal. If you remember back to the last meeting, I presented two calendar options um, from our calendar committee. <clears throat> one of the major differences in the two calendars was that one calendar ended the semester for our high schools before Christmas. However, it was extremely unbalanced in days uh, with 77 days in the first semester, 99 in the second. Uh, the other option that was presented was a more balanced calendar option. I think it was 88 days in the first semester and 87 days in the second semester, but it did require our high school students to take exams after Christmas. Um, and so a goal when we left that meeting was to gain more feedback from our high schools and our calendar committee. We did meet last third excuse me last tuesday to discuss the different options and the results from the surveys um, after conversation i sent a survey out to the calendar committee and um, it was their opinion that we should vote for option a which is a balanced calendar ending the semester in january and that's the one you have in front of you today um, now entertain any any questions that you have, um, that was, it was una una not unanimous, but um, certainly, certainly their opinion that it would best serve the entire Stokes County Schools 
student body. Um, is that calendar? So, um, my question will be remind me again the biggest difference from last year to this year as far as why we couldn't get in more days uh, in first semester and stick yeah. with the so, testing prior, you know, prior to Christmas. State mandated start date of schools. Yep. It, they backed it up even further. Well, um, it's, it's the way it's the way the Monday closest to the 23rd falls. So, the way that it is written. Mm -hmm. Some years you get to, I'm sorry, 26. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, it depends on how that calendar falls. Uh, when the Monday closest to it, the that may start you a week earlier if it's depending on where that falls or it's a week later. And so this is one of those times it's later and it just destroys the calendar. We're essentially have to start a week later than we did this past year. Yeah. Now the, the other option on that, I'm sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, what can districts do to petition them to please, <laughs> you know, not restrict Continue us Continue talking way. to legislators, and we need calendar flexibility more than ever right now with the number right. of kids we have taking college courses and are duly enrolled, um, you know, because in, in the calendar proposal now, you could have a, a college or high school student taking college courses that are starting a brand new semester in January for the college, but still wrapping up a first semester for the high school, right? And there's some overlap there. And so we really need some flexibility to be able to align with the community colleges in our area and do what's right by kids. Um, well, then we also so, have a uh, uh, an online course starting before they actually start school in, in, the, in the fall. I think we could. I, I don't know all the details of so that. That wouldn't be all of our- Mr. Rosa, didn't we used to have some classes at the Northwest Center? that started before school started, and it was a deterrent for our students who decided, you know what, we're not gonna sign up for this because we'll, we're will we gutting into a week or two of our spring break. Well, and like starting back with the fall, you know, when we first started some of the classes where our students were driving to the transportation center. It doesn't align, so you can extend your summer by a couple weeks by changing your course and not doing the class at the transportation center or doing one at the traditional school. So a huge advantage for align into the community college account. Okay. So the way it's, it currently is, we're at a disadvantage. No. It sounds. And, like. and this is a state requirement, so this would be our local representatives at the state level: uh, Kyle Hall, Bill Berger. Um, and again, we we've reached out. This has been an ongoing issue for years and years. Um, and every time we think that we're gaining some traction, it seems like we lose traction. And so we, a couple of years ago, we were very hopeful of a change and, and it just didn't happen. Uh, one of the, the pro major proponents of it that spearheaded it uh, left office and we thought that would help, um, but it hasn't. But any anything that you can do to advocate for our students, we'd appreciate. The precise tech, do they set their own schedule or does the state set it? The state sets I mean, their parameters, I believe. I believe so, but I'm not completely familiar with how they do their calendar. I can ask some questions for you. I mean, with this being an early college and being off the campus in Winston-Salem, it looks to me like they could actually change their schedule at our early college to better suit our high school students because that's who it's for. They, that's they why do. we don't have that overlap. Well, they and, do and, for our early college, mm -hmm. but it doesn't affect our CCP, our College and Career Promise students who are on mm -hmm. campus of their traditional schools. That's the one that's in the crosshairs of it. Our early college does start early and ends early, and that's why they have their separate graduation date. They do follow for Scythex schedule but it's our traditional school students that are that are stuck in the flux of the two calendars okay what well, i want to make sure mr johnson we need to move this to action if we could i would respectfully ask that we do that okay do i have a motion to move this to action so moved second second do i have a motion to move uh traditional calendar proposal option a to action uh motion by mr rogers second by mr brunt all in favor uh, okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I could go back to the COVID update for one item real quickly. When he mentioned Forsyth Tech, I, I failed to mention Forsyth Tech reached out to us late last week. Um, 
about masking. And before, our practice had been the campus, whoever owns the campus, we followed the masking rules. So if our early college were at the Forsyth Tech campus or if our students went to one of the Forsyth Tech campuses, they would follow their rules. But if it was on the campus of West Stokes, per se, then West Stokes rules would be the ones that would be followed. Forsyth Tech, uh, due to Omicron and such, has requested that their classes follow their rules regardless. Um, that So the one class at West, I mean, I'm saying a class at West Stokes, if it has a Forsyth Tech teacher, they would like to follow Forsyth Tech's rules for that. Um, there was not an ultimatum or anything that I'm aware of, but the fear is that that could become an online class if we don't follow that. And so the we would also respectfully ask that we make that one a change as well to say that um, for SciTech classes would follow for SciTech's rules. So basically where the instructor comes from determines the rules instead of the local, who, what campus. Okay. Does that require any action from us? Not really. I mean, it could on the next meeting, but you know, to, to update it for our, our consent agenda, but it, and if you would like to wait and discuss that more, we certainly can, or if we have consensus, we can go ahead and put that in practice. Okay. All right. <coughs> so that concludes our discussion agenda. Uh, move on now to action agenda. Uh, action item A is the approval of personnel and coaching. Uh, we will delay that until after our closed session to, so we can review it. So it brings us to action item B, traditional calendar proposal option A. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the proposed calendar for option A. Okay. Do I need a second? I'll second that motion. Okay, got a motion by Mr. Rogers and a second by Ms. Knight. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay, uh, information and announcements. Uh, Mr. Jones, I guess. Yes, Mr. Chair and board members, I just want to point out our next meeting is January the 24th at 6 p.m. for a regular session. There's also a DARE graduation that will be coming up. I'll try to get that information to you as soon as we have it available. And also want to point out that Athletic schedules for the winter season are included in your packet this morning. I do want to point out we do have a rivalry game in county this Friday. North and South will play basketball against each other. Uh, two strong teams. Uh, and that game is held at South Stokes this Friday. So. And I think both of those teams are probably tied for the lead in the conference. Is that right? I believe they are. Yes, sir. Be a good game. Mm -hmm. Friday night, South Stokes. Okay, any other? Uh, one, uh, one other just part for notification uh, for the calendars that is in there. We, after checking with principals who have checked with staff, uh, last Tuesday became an optional teacher work day, the 4th, and we are looking to pull that off the work days at the end of the year. The June 1st work day on the traditional calendar would become that day for the 4th. June 1st would become a student day and June, uh, May 16th and the early college calendar would become a student day and the seven, May 17th would become a required work day for them. We will get those updated, published, uh, but I know people are wanting to know what the plans are, especially with this Friday that the question would be, uh, question has been would this Friday become a student day uh, but with people already making plans for the long weekend, we did not think that would be serve in our best interest. Okay. All right. I think that concludes our agenda. So uh, we need to uh, go into close. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to go into closed session. Okay. Got a motion. I need a second. I'll second. So I got a motion from Ms. Knight, second from Mr. Bryant. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Let's, uh, we'll go into close at this time. You didn't get to say your spill, Fred. You well, short. we will incorporate it by reference. How about that? This really bothers me. What is it? They are, they're making that right there. They're getting that right there. For their bonus.